Casey Gray here from The Conscious Builder. And on today's show, we have Claire Chandler on with us. She's the president and founder of Talent Boost and specializes in leadership and business acceleration. She taps into over 25 years of experience in people leadership, human resources, and business ownership. She's also the author of The Decision Dashboard, The Whirlpool Effect, and is the co-author of Leading Beyond a Crisis. Today, we get into quite a few topics, but those topics include how to get clear on where your business is going and why this is important, why mindset is the most important thing to focus on as a business leader, what the difference between a leader and a manager is and how to attract, hire, and retain top talent for your business. So I won't hold you up any longer. Here is Claire Chandler. Claire, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks, Casey. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation where there's a few things we're going to get into, which I think are extremely important for every business, not just contractors. But it's especially important right now with the way the, the world is and how much of a mess the, the construction world seems to be. And pretty much everything is a mess these days. But obviously, my, my little world is in the construction world. So, so I see it there more. But before we get into it, I'd just like to share a little bit about yourself, your background and your business experience. And, and then I have a lot of questions I want to get into with you. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so I am uh, a, a self-proclaimed corporate survivor. So I worked in uh, corporate America for uh, for close to 20 years, beginning of my career. Um, and fast forward to now, I work primarily with the investment community to, um, to really help them make smarter decisions about the right companies to invest in. And on the flip side of that transaction, I advise companies that are looking to scale um, on how to better attract the, the right investors. So, you know, in between my time in corporate America and now uh, I've been a consultant for the past 10 years, um, you know, focusing on the, on the strategic level and the leadership level, uh, you know, I've got a, a pretty strong and deep background in communications and branding, how companies and, and individuals sort of show up, um, you know, in the market. Uh, and then I spent a, a good chunk of my career in human resources and talent management. So that's kind of all led me to, to this point. Yeah. And that, that HR side is kind of some of the stuff that I definitely want to get into. Yeah, uh, absolutely. With regards to the, the businesses and invest, investors, like that's something that's important too, because businesses typically need money, even if you're a contracting business. So how are you working with businesses to help them find the right investors? Yeah, you know, it's it's really important. I think that the first the first step I tend to take is to debunk the myth that an influx of capital is going to solve all their problems, right? I think a lot of companies, um, you know, kind of they they do a lot of early work to take the seeds of their idea, their origin story, and get from that point A to point B where they are today. They've established maybe a firm footing, some local or regional success. And now they're looking to get to a point C um, and they don't know quite how to do that on their own, which is why they're looking for, you know, some sort of a, a partner or an outright acquisition. And I always counsel companies who are looking at that stage, um, you know, to, to be very wary uh, and, and not to make that faulty assumption that money is going to solve problems, that that is all that is lacking to get to that point C. Um, you know, when you get to that level where you're looking now, not just to grow and expand, but to in fact scale, there's this whole additional level of complexity that is required. And not every company has the capacity to, to do that. So I work with those companies, not just to attract the right investors, but to be truly attractive, not just on the front end of the deal, but after the close of that acquisition or that investment, um, really giving them more of the horsepower, showing them how to upskill and, and build the capabilities, um, and also determining if they've got the capacity to get to that point C. Yeah, I love that you said that because it's, it's so true, right? We think that money is going to solve all of, all of our problems, and, and it, it never does because usually those same problems will just get bigger with more money <laughs> if you right. haven't solved them to begin with, right? So you have to have a clear plan for it. So thank you so much for, for pointing that out. Well, and I make the analogy to the lottery winner, right? We hear all of these stories about, you know, some, some uh, down on his luck guy who wins a couple million dollars and then he is worse than broke a year later. 
Um, and we see that time and time again. So it's, it's, it's kind of the cautionary tale for businesses that are looking to scale. Money is, uh, will firm up your foundation, but if you don't have the capacity and the vision and the resources and the depth of talent to take you from where you are to where you want to go, you're going to run through that money in no time. So what types of things would you be looking for? So if you're working with a business and you want to make sure that they're, they're set up properly so that they can take on the investment or it makes sense, like what, what are some key indicators that you're looking for within that business? Yeah. So, so here's where the, uh, that phrase change management really kicks in, right? Because um, if, if you've, uh, if you are familiar at all with Marshall Goldsmith, he wrote a book several years ago, what got you here is not going to get you there. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely true, right? I think a lot of business owners and founders and the original leadership team, um, the biggest struggle that they have is breaking away from what has always worked, right? Well, this is the way we've always done this. This is the way we've always run our operations. This is the way we've always brought on new people. Um, these are the types of skills that have you know, really gotten us to, to where we are. And so the biggest shift that they have to make is a mindset one. It's not even an infrastructure one, although infrastructure is important, right? It's really getting them to, to, to get out of their own way. And so I, you know, I mentioned before the term capacity. Um, capacity and capability are two very different things, right? Capability is um, skills and you can fill in some of those gaps with training, with additional people. Capacity is a bigger animal. And that's where I spent a lot of time, both on the company side and on the investor side, to really assess, does this team, especially at the leadership level, have the the mental and physical capacity to do things in a different way, to raise the level of their game? And and sadly, not everybody does. And so the quicker you can determine that, the quicker that you can size that up, the easier it will be to make decisions about what you might need and whether you're ready or not for that next level of investment and scaling. Yeah. Mindset is so important. Well, another saying that I love it, it's all about the mindset, like the success of a company is typically based on the mindset of the leader. And if that leader's mindset is, has any blockages for any reason, that's going to just trickle down into the business for sure. In terms 100%. Of growth and, and yep. So I do want to talk a little bit about leadership. What is leadership to you? Yeah, so it, it's interesting, and I'm glad you asked the question because people ask me all the time, you know, what's what's the difference between a manager and a leader, right? Um, and can someone be both? And the short answer is you absolutely can be both. But, you know, the, the quick definition I always rely on is a manager will tell you what to do, and a leader will tell you why that matters, right? Um, and not everyone understands or appreciates that distinction. And not everyone has has quite mastered that, right? So most leaders start out as managers. They are task oriented, they're outcome oriented. They say, you know, we in order to get up that hill, we need these skills, these tasks, these milestones, right? A leader's already at the top of the hill saying, this is where I want to go next and this is why, right? So a, a leader is more of a visionary, definitely strategic Um, definitely takes that big picture mindset um, and seeks clarity first. And that's another thing I think companies tend to struggle with is they are so um, deluged by the day-to-day decision-making and the firefighting that they often forget to pick their heads up out of the foxhole and say, are we still heading in the direction we intended? Yeah. And uh, I love that. And the way you describe that, because I feel like I can, manage because I've had to do it in the past, but I don't love doing it. Like, I feel like when I'm in my prime is when I'm doing that visionary work, when I'm planning, figuring out the why, looking further and further ahead. And that's when I'm in the best mood ultimately, <laughs> because yeah. I'm doing what I love, right? And I, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of leaders are like that. And there must be, and, and I think that's also where a lot of businesses can get into trouble, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's easy to to almost get too far ahead and forget what actually is happening or what needs to happen in order to get to the next step. Right. If you're, if you're at step three and the leader might be working on step six, but you're like, Hey, we haven't got to step four yet. We can't do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, you run into issues like that. Oh, absolutely. All the time. Um, And I think, you know, the, the, the key first is if you are working for a leader who very clearly can see, 
you know, multiple steps down the road and can see where they're, they're headed. That is a great first start because I can tell you a lot of people who call themselves leaders have lost that clarity, right? So any business that I work with, that's the very first thing we do is either confirm or get to a point of absolute mission clarity. Where in fact are we headed? What are we in business to accomplish? Uh, you do a lot, obviously, in the construction industry. It is not sufficient just to say, well, you know, we're, we're in the business of building homes or building offices or, or, you know, building X. Why are you there? Why is your business different? Why, you know, what drives you? Um, you talked about if you could stay in that visionary and that strategic perspective all day long, you'd be, you know, a, a real happy guy. Well, clearly that's your genius zone, right? And we all kind of have those moments where we go, yeah, you know, I remember last week I was working on something and I was so engrossed in, engrossed in it and so enjoying what I was doing, I lost complete track of time. That's actually a good problem to have because it means you're in the zone, right? Um, so we think clarity is absolutely a foundational piece to, to building and growing a business. And once you have that, the biggest piece that is often missing between a leader seeing 10 steps ahead and you know their middle managers and the and the individual contributors saying, wait a second, we're still stumbling through step one. Is they may be clear on the why, but have they truly conveyed that to their people? Back when I you know I mentioned I was a corporate survivor, right? So back in my corporate days, I had um, you know I, I had the good fortune of having some really great teams, and I had this post-it note right above my computer monitor at my desk, and it said, "Tell them why." And it was a constant reminder for me that it is not sufficient for an employee to be told what to do. They truly do need to understand why that individual task or their individual role is important in the grand scheme of things. So it's great for leaders who have a strategic perspective and a vision and that clarity, but if they are not turning around and making sure that their people are following in lockstep and are bought into that vision and can kind of see, okay, that's the top of the hill and this is what we achieve when we get there, then they're missing a step. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Now, what about the the businesses? Like maybe somebody's listening to this right now and they're like, you know what, that that's true. I, you know, I'm not clear on where we're going. How do you get clear? Do you have any exercises or 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 tips on how to get a little bit more clear on your why? Because it's easy, especially, a lot of people, I'm just going to speak from experience. When I started the business, I didn't really have a why, like 11 yeah. years ago, however long ago it was. And I had to get clear on where I was going. But at the time, I, I just wanted to, you know, I was young. I just wanted to start my business, make some money, do good work. That was that was my why. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, yeah. And I, there's probably a lot of contractors who start a lot of business owners who start the same way. They just like something, they get into it. But then, as you know, that that's not enough. If you don't have the powerful why when, you know, shit hits the fan at uh, it's, it's going to be a lot harder to get through. You need that why to keep pulling you through. So how do, how do business owners get clear on where it is that they're going and why they're going there? Yeah, and, and to your point, I think the why is the unifier, right? The, the what is sort of the firefighting mode. The why is, is what keeps uh, continuing to pull us forward. Um, I'm actually going to put the question back to you because I think there was a why when you first started your business. So when, when you first did did form your business it was all about construction correct yeah it was just construction it wasn't on the sustainable side at that point it was just construction. okay okay and and why of all the businesses you could have started why did you pick that one because i was a carpenter and i was good at it <laughs> and did you enjoy what you did oh yeah yeah still love carpentry and what did you enjoy about it i enjoyed i just enjoyed working with my hands right mm -hmm. and being able to see a project come together right from start to finish. And what was your favorite part starting out? When I started the business? Yeah. I I think I was I've always been driven by by potential, right? The potential for something to turn into something else. So whenever mm -hmm. I think that there's an opportunity, there's there's potential in something, I'm driven by that and I love getting things started and then I'll lose moment I need to bring on team members or people to help me. I've, that's what I've learned at the, now. <laughs> right? yeah. I, I love getting things started. I can see the vision. I can see the end. I love getting it going, but then I'm, I move on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't look now, but you have a why, right? This, this, this idea of being driven by potential. 
by the potential of what something could be um, between when you hammer that first nail or when you we you have that first sketch um, to, to what it becomes is absolutely a, a, a motivating vision for you in a, in a mission. So that's great. And the other thing, kudos to you, because a lot of leaders are very slow to the game to realize that they can't do everything themselves. It is why we have employees, right? The reason that businesses grow is not just because you land a client and you know you need to get a couple of hours sleep in at night. You also do recognize that you're not supposed to do everything yourself. Um, and so all the things that you just kind of touched upon, you, you do have a vision, you have this sort of driving mission of realizing potential, right? And, and getting there, but you also have enough self-awareness to say, I can't get there myself. I'm, I'm the vision guy. I can see where I want to go. I'm driven by that. And then I'm smart enough to know that I can't do all of the, the tangible steps from, from A to B all on my own, either because I don't have the will or I don't have the skill. So there, there is a, there is a mission for you there, right? <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's a, it was a very kind of long way to get back around to answering your question, but I, I proved that and kind of pulled it out of you just by asking a couple of questions. And I think, you know, founders especially lose touch with that first spark, that first idea, that first joy that they built their business around. And it's really important to reconnect with that as you grow, as you add on people, because without that clarity, you may lose your way. You may forget what it is that you're striving for. You may forget what direction you're supposed to head. And you are going to be far um, less equipped to attract and select and deploy and motivate the right kinds of people to add to your team. So that clarity is is 100% foundational. And those are just some of the ways that we can kind of draw them out of you. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Uh, that's, <laughs> You're I very got welcome. Lots of going here. But this is a perfect segue into where I was going to go next with with regards to employees. Right now, we're all at the whole, where you are, where we are across the nation. Like people are struggling with manpower and keeping up in the construction industry these days. Not even just on site, it's supply. It's ev- it's everywhere uh, right yeah. now. So how do we? How do companies, I guess there's three things because we were talking before we officially started recording, you know, you have to find the right employees, you need to get them on board, but then you also need to keep them, right? Yeah. So how, how do you go about doing this? Let's start with how do you, how do you find the team members that you need for your team? Yeah. And, and you do really have to reverse engineer that as we were talking before we started, uh, started this episode um, I have a lot of clients and, uh, you know, just people in my network who have been reaching out to me for the past several months saying, we are really struggling to find people. Um, either, you know, just there, there aren't enough people out there. Total myth, not true. Um, there are a lot of people that just don't want to work. Total myth, not true. Um, but we just can't get out in front of them. That's just one side of the coin. The other, as you just touched upon, is are you doing the right things once you bring people in? to keep them, to keep them motivated. Um, And again, part of that starts with that clarity that we already talked about, right? Being really, really clear on what you are in business to accomplish. And, you know, for those of your, uh, of your audience who are listening and saying, okay, but I'm in a, I'm in an industry or I'm in a business that's not terribly sexy and it's not terribly mission driven. And, you know, we just sort of get from, from A to B and that's, that's kind of our lifeblood. I would challenge you to reconsider that every single business has a mission. Every single business has a purpose, even in, you know, your most blue collar construction, you know, hammer and nails and saws and all of that sort of thing, type of a business, your people, regardless of whether you need them, you know, outside working with their hands or inside an office supporting an operation, they need a reason to believe. They need a reason to belong, right? So you need to get back in touch with that. You've got to reestablish that, that clarity. Once you do that, and again, back to this um, conversation about, you know, a leader who is 10 steps ahead and is really clear about his or her why, you have to also make sure that you are showing each of your people the connection between what they do, what they're good at, what they enjoy, and how it helps move the needle toward that mission. If you start to do those things in a more regular, consistent, natural basis, 
your culture is going to become what you really want it to be, which is, you know, reinforcing your mission, reinforcing your own passion, helping you get there in ways that are more enthusiastic and, you know, above and beyond. And those are the things that are going to help you attract more people to your cause, so to speak, right? Um, I, I really should have started that with, there's no quick fix to if you are desperate for, for talent um, and you're just not finding enough people, that is right now, unfortunately, it's a universal problem, but it becomes easier and easier to attract the right people into your orbit if you are clear on what you're doing, if your people believe in what they're doing, and if they are enthusiastically contributing their whole heads, hands, and hearts to making that a reality. Yeah, one of the things that I've that stuck with me over the years is I always hear you hear people talking about, you know, the customer's number one, the customer's number one, the customer's number one sort of thing. But I believe that the employees are almost number one because if you if you take care of your team, if you take care of the employees, they'll take care of the customers. They can put the customer number one. That's and I think right. that's that's where you, you kind of create those raving fans internally, and then they'll go out and create those external raving fans as well, which once again is, is easier said than, than done. It <laughs> but is. Those, those are, those are things that, that we like to focus on here. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I have always believed that great companies are built from the inside out. You don't become a great company because you find a great customer. You find great customers, you serve great customers, and you keep great customers by being great yourself, right? And not just talented, because I know plenty of companies that have really talented performers, but their behavior is atrocious, <laughs> right? And that's not sustainable. Right. Um, and so, yes, you absolutely, the, the way that you grow, the way you sustain, and the way that you as a leader actually enjoy leading is by creating an environment and surrounding yourself with a team who believe in what you're doing and love what they do. Yeah. Have you changed your approach at all? Like the world has changed over the last year, year and a half. I don't even know how long you've been in it anymore, right? So <laughs> it's been a while, I know, it feels yeah. like 20 years, right? <laughs> but have, have you changed anything into how you approach business or how you work with people uh, since our world has changed as we know it? Yeah, it, you know, it, it's been difficult because obviously all of us had to, um, had to pivot toward a more remote way of working, even in the construction industry. I mean, I have, uh, most of my clients are in um, more blue collar industries, construction and manufacturing and mining and all of that. Um, and so the, the, the heart and the lifeblood of their operations really didn't change what they did and what their role looks like other than really how they spent their breaks, right? How they interacted with their team to get the work done. Um, but historically, the way that I best interacted with my clients was physically being in the same room with them, right? Because there is, there's a lot to be said for, I'm going to say channeling, because that's going to sound really woo, but sort of feeling the energy and feeding off of the energy of the other people around the table or on the job site or, you know, in the room with you. Um, and so obviously over the last year and a half, I've really had to pull that back and have made, you know, 100% of my interactions like the one we're having today, which is over Zoom, over video conference, over the telephone. Um, you know, if, if we can get together being so socially distanced that it's really hard to kind of get that, that team vibe going. Um, and it was a little bumpy at first, I'll, I'll be totally honest, because I think, you know, for, for me, what lights me up is being in the same room with the people that I'm trying to help, right? And, and, and work with and collaborate and pull magic out of um because i'm not the one who stands in front of them and, and does the magic i find it in you like that's that's where it is it, ha it has little to do with me it has everything to do with you and you know kind of helping you get out of your own way and and shining a light on things and it was far easier to do that in person um so you know thankfully if we were going to have a global pandemic <laughs> it's at a time where we've got some technology that allows us to still see and you know kind of feed off of each other even if we're even if we're distant so um so i've I, i've made it work as every other business has had to to make it work um i've always considered myself an introvert and i didn't really think i was going to miss interacting with people in the same place but uh boy when you're when you're you know you go from well it's a ch it's a choice not to interact with people in person to you physically cannot be in the same room with people outside your bubble uh, it's, it's amazing how closely you miss it. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> a lot of people struggling with that these days, right? And yeah. it's adding to the stress, unfortunately, that in the pressure and everything, because you don't have, you know, we're human, we're all social beings for the yeah. most part. Most of us are anyways. <laughs> yeah. And if yeah. you can't do that, it's like, yeah, you can talk to people and do video calls and have phone calls. It's just not the same though. Definitely not. Yeah, yeah. So I do want to end with, you, you've done a few books. One of them is the Decision Matrix. Uh, that can all be online. But you talk in that, you have the three line landmines that entrepreneurs yeah. typically stumble over or step on or however you want to define that. Yeah. You want to touch on those a little bit because I think those are really important. And a lot of the people that we talk to are, new, they're newer to business. They've been in business for a little while, but if we can avoid, help them avoid these landmines, I think that would be extremely important and valuable to them. Yeah, great. Um, so we've touched upon uh, at least one of them a couple of times. So in in writing this book, The Decision Dashboard, I had done a lot of, uh, you know, obviously drawing upon my own experience as a consultant over the last 10 plus years, um, you know, not to mention my, my corporate experience, which I didn't, you know, just sort of dismiss as I, as I left there. Um, but more recently, I had a lot of conversations with um, people in, in large organizations who are responsible for identifying and deploying talent, especially at the leadership level. And I also had a lot of conversations with people who are in leadership roles. And all of that research and all of my own experience um, kind of came down to, to these three landmines that, that you speak of that really drive up the failure rate of leaders and, of course, by extension, businesses. And the first one is lack of mission clarity. Well, we've kind of touched upon that quite a bit already. If you're, and I hope by now your your listeners can kind of you know nod their heads and say, yeah, I can totally see why if I'm not clear on what it is that we're all about and where we're headed, that can be a landmine. The second one is is lack of preparedness, right? So I spoke before about capacity and capability. If you don't have the right people in the right roles with the right skills, the right motivation. You're only going to, going to get so far, regardless of how clear your mission is. The third one is indecisiveness. Every leader I know, especially in the beginning, struggles with having to make decisions, whether they are those short-term micro day-to-day -day decisions or those longer-term macro strategic where are we headed decisions. And they struggle with the fact that they never have 100% of the data that they need to make those decisions with complete confidence. And I can tell you from experience that it's the lack of decisions that will torpedo your success and your forward motion way quicker than making the wrong decision. If you're clear on your mission, if you have prepared your people to the extent possible, and if you truly understand what is you know, fundamentally required to get to that mission, and you stay focused on that to have you guide your decisions, even if you make the wrong one, you're able to react from that. You're able to learn from that. You're able to apply that and not repeat those same mistakes. So this is an exercise you asked me before about, you know, what are some of the exercises I do with clients, uh, especially around mission clarity. Um, and I think I mentioned before, that's one of the very first fundamental steps that I take a client through is to either confirm or, or get to a place of mission clarity. And then I take them, take them through this exercise to say, okay, if that's your you know, your point B or even your point C, how are we going to get there? What are some of the fundamentals required? What are some of your competitive strengths, et cetera, et cetera. And we get down to literally this one page dashboard that they can, you know, I, every client I, I have worked with that I take them through this exercise, even if I haven't worked with them in a couple of years, when I talk to them, I say, where's your dashboard? And they go, it's in my pocket. Because we go through this exercise and we get it from this sort of fire hose dose of daily overwhelm of all the different decisions we could make and all the different things we've got to factor into our decision making and all the data points, right? And narrow that in on a very hyper-focused mission-oriented dashboard. It makes those decisions a lot easier. So the more I've taken people through this exercise, and I have so many other frameworks and exercises I've done with clients, this is the one that everybody keeps coming back to and saying that I rely on this so heavily that I decided to write a book around it. It's not a, it's not a terribly long book. It's not going to take anybody a, a you know long time to read it, um, but it really walks you through step by step how to build your own dashboard 
And it's it's really going to solve those those three landmines. It's going to get you much clearer. It's going to help you be better prepared. And it is sure as hell going to help you become way more confident in your decision making. I love that because not making a decision is also a decision as well. One hundred percent. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. So we'll, we'll make sure that we share the link for that down below as well. But before we let you go, Claire, is there any last parting words of advice? You've already given us a lot of wisdom, but is there anything that you want to share before we end this conversation? Um, yeah. So, so uh, thank you again for, for the opportunity just to, just to come on here and jam with you. I've loved the conversation. Um, it, you know, I think for me, it, it, it comes down to leaders have a lot of choices they could make. And as you said, the lack of a choice is a choice as well. Um, and they are rarely as confident as they project themselves to be, often because they either don't know the right decision to make or you know, a lot of leaders that I've spoken to have this sort of doubt in the beginning that they even deserve to be at the level that they're at, right? Did I really earn the success that I've had? Do I, am I really worthy of being followed as I build and I lead and I grow this business? And I would say that it's okay to be humble. In fact, it's required, right? And it is really okay to show some of that vulnerability to your people. You never want them to feel like you don't know where you're headed, but you absolutely want to involve them in, um, you know, building the roadmap to get there. The more people you involve, right? I always say people support what they help to create. Um, if you do that in a vacuum, if you're standing, as we said earlier, on the hill, 10 steps ahead, and all your people are at the bottom of the hill going, but how, where's the first foothold? And you say, but you can't believe the view once we get up here. There's too big of a gap and you've got to help them you know, grow with you. And they, in fact, if they know where they're headed, are going to help you figure out the steps to get there. Um, so that's, you know, that's what I would add to that. And, and once you start to make those steps in a positive direction and have the right team around you, that's going to boost your confidence too. Yeah, absolutely. And if people want to book a call, I think they can book a call with you as well. Is that correct? They absolutely can. Um, so the the two links I'm sure we're going to drop in the show notes. The, the one is if you want to grab a copy of the decision dashboard, there's an ebook that is bundled with a bunch of uh, free bonus material. Go to decisiondashboard.com. Um, but if any of what we've talked about resonates with you and you want to chat with me, uh, you can set up a free 15 minute call. Just go to discoverywithclaire.com. And I'd love to get to know you a little bit better and, and see if we can help you get unstuck. Well, Claire, thank you so much for hopping on here and chatting with us about how to get unstuck and how to grow our team and make better decisions and continue moving forward. And obviously we can't all do that in a short conversation, but this, it, like I said, I got a bunch of notes here already. That's why I love these conversations because I always take notes and the things that I need to bring back to my team. Are th they're always reminders, right? A lot of times we we know what to do a lot of times. We just need to be yeah. constantly reminded and have somebody there to be like, did you do this? Did you do that? Or ask questions like you did today. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Glad you watched until the very end. If you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the bell button so that you get all the notifications and all the great content that we are releasing. And if you enjoyed this interview, be sure to check out all the other interviews that we've done. We got some great ones there. You can click on the link to check those out. And remember to live consciously.